microphone because I can't hear you. When you start to downsize and, and take it away, then there's always uh, some type of replacement. As a government agent, uh, when you're looking at the budget, we are in a very, very tight situation in regards to the budget. There are some tough decisions we do have to make, but at the same time, we need some type of representation of what are we going to do when we have these investigations, when we have these um, civil concerns. There was an incident that happened, and we did not have a way to get to anybody to give us the answer to what we need. So when you start to, uh, and I agree with Mr. Alex Harris, we have to make some tough, tough decisions. It's not the way that we used to do things, but at the same time, we also have to look at why and what we're doing and what we're going to put in replacement of it. And it doesn't take much. It just takes just a little bit of work. And uh, tax, um, we had a very um, income and revenue. Revenues is coming in very slow. And we have this emergency manager that has really taken control. And when he leaves, the question would be, go back to the voters, and we'll put together a plan. What do the voters think? Let's have our community meeting. What do you think could we replace that uh, department with without being a burden uh, to the uh, citizen or putting a strain on the budget? question is, would you support the reinstatement of both offices, the Ombudsman and the Civil Service Commission, and please give reason for your answer. Okay, I just want to make sure I was on track with what I was saying. Yes, I believe that those are both very important offices. One, the Ombudsman was started back in the 70s with uh, several great people, including uh, Mr. Ananip at that time, and I can't remember the other guy's name, I want to say Joseph someone. And we had outstanding ombudsmen that ran the department from uh, Baycar to Buchanan to Purifoy was the last one. And their sole job was to respond to concerns that the citizens have. And the majority was uh, regarding the police department from arrest to uh, procedures. Then uh, also the water department <coughs> and so on. But the people at least knew when they went to that department, they were going to get some type of response, some type of follow through. And if changes needed to be made, it would be brought before council to say, okay, this procedure is not effective, it's not working, uh, we are suggesting this to happen. And uh, it would be looked at and decided. So, but it was more neutral. It's where someone could feel safe that someone was going to listen to their concern, not just go to a water department or police department and make a complaint. Because people, you know, there has to be more time put into these type of situations. So this was the outlet that was available. Now we have no outlet. Now look at some of the concerns that are coming up. The water department, when you walk into City Hall, it's like, there's nobody really here to listen to me. The other part of Civil Service Commission. Civil Service was there to take care of problems that employees were facing, no matter if it was Hurley Hospital, if it was somebody from a Department of Public Works. Uh, it's like, were they being treated fairly in promotions, uh, in their firing, uh, in changes of their job? And this was a group of citizens who were there to review these cases and meet with the supervisors, meet with the employees, and make a decision. We have to look out for the people that are Ms. part Van of the Buren. city and are Ms. Van your time Thank is you. up. Okay. Now, we're going to move on to the master plan because it's been receiving a lot of public attention. And in fact, we talked about it last week. I know you all have been studying it. So the question is, are you in favor of the proposed master plan? And if so, what does it do for your board? If not, explain why. And we're going to start with Councilman Lawley. Thank you. Um, yes, I am uh, very much in support of the master plan. Uh, it has. Um, for the most part, uh, it, it, the response that I received from constituencies and the meetings that I've been in with constituencies, uh, it addresses our community and economic development, uh, as well as uh, uh, issues that, that are related to crime uh, in the master plan. Um, 
Is it a perfect document at this point? No, it's not. Uh, there are concerns that have been, that have been voiced uh, regarding uh, the master plan as it relates to uh, land use, uh, green space. Uh, how will that green space be maintained uh, once homes are demolished and even with the green spaces that we have currently? Uh, I think those are things that needs to, that needs to be included in the master plan because uh, we have a tax revenue that can't, uh, can't main, maintenance the uh, green space that we have currently. And so we need to, as we look in the future, how we're going to maintenance that green space in the future is, is really critical that we address that in the master plan. I have been in discussions with uh, the concerned pastors and uh, the mayor uh, regarding uh, ways to, uh, to clean the green spaces that we have, uh, doing something similar to what the uh, land bank is doing currently with their clean and green program by utilizing some of our community block grant dollars to maintain uh, the green spaces that we have. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, I do um, support the master plan in that one, we need a plan. Um, everything in the plan at this point may not be the way we'd like it to be. Um, in the seventh ward, I received um, positive feedback from those that have given me feedback. I think that um, the thing that, that I, I appreciate is in the um, charter, it states um, in 4-505 periodic review of the plan. It says, after approval of the plan, the mayor shall annually propose any amendments necessary to keep the plan current and the city council, after review by the planning commission, shall consider the mayor's proposed amendments and make the modifications in the plan that it deems necessary. And so this is a living document. It is a work in progress. And so um, I, I support it at this point, but I'm still researching it. Thank you. As I understand it, the master plan is a blueprint for our future. I think that's wonderful. Trouble is, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a good one in the theoretical. And I don't take this as a criticism of, as I said, uh, the master plan, I'm sure, has great value and importance going forward. But I'm one who wants to talk about the implementation not only the master plan's thoughts or, or uh, goals, but what we as a community are going to do, not only far into the future, but in the short term, in the here and now. Right now, and, and this is no secret, I'm telling you what you know. You already have been aware, time and time again, through media, that we're a, con or a city, that is probably the per capita leader in homicides. The arson rate in this city per capita is the greatest in the country. The fact is, we're devoid of a, a, a comprehensive and effective public safety plan. Right now, in fact, the last week or so, we had a police chief named, an interim police chief from Detroit, all well and good. But you know what? I know, and many others know, a little secret about this community. We have great talent and ability, and sometimes, as I see with some of the people here, untapped resources. And one of the great untapped resources in recent years, I didn't often agree with past mayors and how they ran the city, but let me just mention one thing in a police chief perspective, police chief. Brad Barksdale, perhaps some of you have heard of him. He was a fine police chief. And we had the opportunity to bring an individual such as Mr. Staff. Harris. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you uh, repeat that question so I can get a clear one? Yes. The question is, are you in favor of the proposed master plan? And if so, what does it do for your ward? If not, explain why. 
Uh, yes, I am um, in agreement with the um, master plan or plan of that sort. Um, if you don't have a plan, then you don't know where you're going. And however, within that plan, there are, it's just a plan, it's a goal to where we see uh, the city of Flint going. Flint has strong cultural uh, values. And we're sitting in one of the probably the strongest um, communities sitting right here around around this cultural center. And when I'm looking at that plan, that plan seems to be driving us and holding on to what we do have. In my ward, I talk to a few people, we try to get um, some of them to come out and get a little bit more of their input. Just those that I do, that I did get the input from, um, they, we are doing, we, eight, the eight ward is pretty a sustainable ward. And we're trying to keep that ward sustainable. Uh, we have the power school, and and if you look at the master plan, it's trying to get us that way where the whole community as a whole is sustainable. And I would like, uh, once again, to meet with the community and get a more input on what that master plan for our community has in plan for us and how would the people actually feel about it. Um, the green space, they talk about that, and they talk about uh, demolishing some of those abandoned homes, which would make our property value go up. As long as we have um, bad homes and eliminated uh, uh, <coughs> houses, houses like going anywhere in our property value uh, has the tendency to go down. So as we move forward with this master plan, yes, I'm agreeing with it, but at the same time, we still need, need a little bit more 